Hi there, my name is Siobhan Fallon. Today, let's talk about Kate and Fred Benteen. In my opinion, Fred Benteen is the most complicated, controversial, and entertaining member of the 7th Cavalry. Uh, we always talk about him and his relationship with George Custer, but I think we should rewind a little bit to his pre-7th Cavalry days, because they were kind of crazy. Um, and if we think that George Custer and Fred Benteen had a really rocky relationship, just wait till we talk about Benteen's chain of command in the 10th Missouri Cavalry. Um, and also Benteen's relationship with his father, like the divisions in this man's life are intense. However, his relationship with his wife was a constant throughout his life. And it's thanks to her that we have so many photos, letters, newspaper clippings, scrapbooks, all sorts of just fantastic material about Fred's life that gives us great insight into what it was like being a military family on the frontier, but also just wonderful insights into the Little Bighorn fight. So thank you for joining me. Um, one thing, there is just so much to Benteen's life. I'm not able to get it all into this video right now. So please subscribe. I'm working on part two. I hope to have it done really soon and um, you'll get an alert when it's finished. But uh, I, think, I think it's worth not having me talk and talk and talk forever now. You'll be happy I broke it up into two parts. Okay, thanks so much guys. Let's go. Let's talk about Benteen. Frederick William Benteen was born in St. Petersburg, Virginia on August 24th, 1834. He had an older sister, Henrietta, born in 1831, and a younger brother, Theodore, born in 1837. Charlie Benteen, Fred's dad, owned a commercial paint and a paint supplier business, which did rather well. Well enough that the Benteen family owned two slaves, a woman and her daughter, and they were well off enough that Fred was able to attend a private school. Benteen's mother, Caroline, died in 1841 of consumption. She was only 31 years old and Fred was only seven when he lost her. We can't know what sort of impact this had on Fred Benteen, but in 1866, Fred would cut this piece of ivy from her grave and he would keep it in his scrapbook for the rest of his life. Uh, Fred's dad, Charlie, did remarry a widow with three children, but the marriage didn't last very long. And as far as I've read, Fred Benteen never mentions his stepmother or his stepsisters in any later letters. So sort of get the feeling that the Charlie Benteen household was not necessarily a very happy place. Catherine Louisa Norman was born in Philadelphia on March 30th, 1838. Her parents were Henry and Elizabeth Norman. Kate was the second oldest. She had an older sister, Anne or Anita. Then Kate was born. Then she had a brother, Leslie, a little sister, Marcella, and the baby, William. In the mid 1850s, the Normans moved from Philadelphia to St. Louis. And then sadly, in September of 1856, Kate's father, Henry, dies of the bloody flux or dysentery. Kate was only 18 and the oldest son, Leslie, was only 13 years old. There's this really wonderful letter Kate's father wrote her when she was 14 going on 15 and away from home visiting family. And I think it gives a neat glimpse into the family dynamics there. Her dad writes, quote, in regards to your flirtations, I'm glad to hear you are enjoying your time, but I hope you will not let an Italian or any other gentleman make any impression of a serious nature upon your mind from so short an acquaintance. In this letter, Kate's dad also mentions a secret marriage that Anne had gotten into with a Mr. Dice. And Anne had sort of a troubled life and her relationships sort of impact the Benteens, Fred and Kate. Anne had a baby, a little girl, and Kate's mother would raise this child, Violet. Uh, but Anne did play perhaps a positive role in Kate and Fred meeting. 
So family lore is that Fred met Kate through his dad because his father was pursuing Anne, Kate's older sister, which is a little creepy because the dad was 29 years older than Anne. And I'm not sure if it lines up because Anne could have been in another state at that point. But anyway, the story is there was some romance there. Kate and Fred met and they lived happily ever after. So let's take a moment to talk about St. Louis since it seems like everyone's moving to St. Louis. And yeah, everyone was moving to St. Louis. Why? In 1840, St. Louis had 20,000 inhabitants. 10 years later, in 1850, there were 78,000 people there. Only a decade later, the population had swelled to 160,000 people. St. Louis at this time was the largest U.S. city west of Pittsburgh, had the second largest port in the country with commercial tonnage only exceeded by New York City. The port had traffic from the Ohio, Missouri, Mississippi, and Illinois rivers. And that was thanks to the engineering skills of a young officer named Robert E. Lee. St. Louis was tremendously important for Western expansion from the gold rush onward. <laughs> So it's the eve of the Civil War. We need to remember that Missouri was a slave state. There were 54,000 farms in Missouri. Of those, 8,000 farms had slaves. Um, however, the majority of the workforce was actually made up of immigrants, especially German immigrants and free African Americans. When Abraham Lincoln was elected in the fall of 1860, the South started talking of succession. In April 1861, we have the fight at Fort Sumner in the Charleston Harbor, South Carolina, the first battle of the Civil War. St. Louis was a city divided. Now, the majority of Missourians in 1860-1861 sided with the Union but many of the state politicians were sympathetic to the Confederate cause. So as soon as war was decreed, the Union military leaders in St. Louis, especially Captain Nathaniel Lyon, who was the commanding officer at the St. Louis Arsenal, quickly established federal control and disarmed any Confederate militias there. Meanwhile, Fred Benteen was resisting supposed solicitations to join the Union cause though he had been actively training local Union troops. Benteen was in a really tricky family situation, and it was probably one that a lot of families were feeling across Missouri and across America at the time. Here's how Benteen describes it. Quote, to a man born and raised in the South as I was, where states' rights and nullification were among the earliest remember words with the whole atmosphere of the house and home circle reeking of politics and disunion sentiments, it was not so natural or such an easy matter to rush with bayonet fixed upon home, country, and friends against father, brother, and all the dear chums and companions of school and college days. Captain Lyon was promoted to Brigadier General and given a brigade of Union forces. He devised a plan to attack an enormous Confederate force near Wilson's Creek. He split his Union forces into a two-pronged assault, which might sound a little familiar to those of you who studied the Little Bighorn. The 22,000 rebels outnumbered Union forces five to one. Now, German-born Colonel Franz Siegel took his 1,200-man brigade, which was made up of many German immigrants, and he was to attack from the southeast. Brigadier General Lyon took 3,700 men and attacked from the northwest. Siegel was slow. Lyon was not. Siegel's brigade came late and fled too soon. When they retreated, all the rebels turned on Lyon's greatly outnumbered men. And here's a few names that you probably know, but if you don't, you should remember. 
Miles Moylan of later 7th Cavalry fame. He was a sergeant, but that day he was an acting company commander in a regular Army Dragoon company. William D. Bowen. He was one of the mounted volunteers trying to protect an isolated infantry battalion. And in another volunteer regiment, the surgeon, Florence Cornyn, suddenly picked up a musket and started firing away, and this would launch his military career. Meanwhile, Brigadier Lyon, already wounded twice, managed to lead a counterattack. He was killed. At Lyon's death, Sam Sturgis, who will someday be the commander of the 7th Cavalry, assumed command of Lyon's brigade. Sturgis then also chose to retreat. Now, Benteen was only 27 years old. As we mentioned earlier, he had been, quote, setting up and drilling troops at the time. He called his position there a sightseer. Uh, that would immediately change. He said that the, quote, battle and loss of the fight at Wilson's Creek decided me that a man with my views could no longer withhold his services and life if necessary for the preservation of his country. Fred Benteen joins the Union Army in September 1861 as a cavalry officer in Bowen's Battalion of Volunteers. When his father finds out, he supposedly said, I hope the first goddamn bullet gets you. Benteen himself said, quote, the prayers of my nearest kin were being offered up that I might get so badly wounded that I could render no service to the government of the United States. Benteen's most stout and ardent defender was surely his girlfriend, Kate Norman. In January of 1862, Benteen requested leave to save his sister from her abusive husband and bring her home to St. Louis. Benteen also used this leave to marry his sweetheart. They were married at St. George's Episcopal Church in St. Louis on January 7, 1862. None of Benteen's family served as witnesses, just Kate's little sister, Marcella, and her mother, Elizabeth. Benteen then sets Kate up in a house in St. Louis, and three days later, he is back at the front with Bowen's battalion. When you look at the schism in Benteen's family home, you can see why he will someday write to Kate and their son, quote, kisses and love unbounded to both you and Fred, who are the only people I know of in this wide, wide world who really care for your devoted husband. The luxury steamer Fair Play had been seized by the Confederates and was being used as a gun runner, as fast as a steamer can run guns. Now, who do you think was the chief engineer on board? Yep, you guessed it one Charlie Benteen. So Charlie's sympathies didn't just rest with the rebel cause. He actually, actively, was helping and working for the Confederates. On the evening of August 17th, 1862, Confederates loaded the fair play with muskets and ammunition. It anchored around 11 p.m. that night in a bend in the Mississippi River. Meanwhile, Fred Benteen's Company C of Bowen's Battalion were serving as a select transport security for a Union flotilla that was on an intelligence mission on the Mississippi. At 1 a.m. April 18th, those on board the Fair Play spotted the Union flotilla coming right at them. Someone shouted, Charlie, how much steam you got? And Charlie's reply was, not enough to turn the wheel over. Charlie Benteen and others were captured at Pistol and Cutlass Point. Put your hands in the air! <laughs> the inventory was 1,200 new Enfield rifles, 4,000 new muskets, and a large quantity of fixed ammunitions for field guns, mountain howitzers, and small arms. Big win for the Union. 
big loss for the rebels. Big win for Fred Benteen. Big loss for old Charlie. Charlie Benteen would not be released with the other civilian prisoners from the fair play. Mm -mm. He would remain a prisoner until the end of the war. That's two and a half years. <laughs> Maybe Benteen just wanted to keep his dad out of trouble. Maybe he wanted to teach his dad a lesson. Either way, you don't cross Fred Benteen. Benteen does not forget. As we will continue to see, Benteen does not forget anything. The fighting didn't only occur between the Union and Confederate armies. In December 1862, Lieutenant Colonel Bowen's 9th and now Colonel Cornyn's 10th Missouri Cavalries <laughs> were combined into a single regiment, the 10th Missouri, with Colonel Cornyn at the helm. And the animosity between Cornyn and Bowen beats anything we later see in the 7th Cavalry. One officer of the 10th Missouri wrote that there was a, quote, continual war amongst the officers of this regiment. Both Bowen and Cornyn were exceptionally daring cavalry officers. They were audacious and reckless. Both were always having the other arrested and court-martialed. In August 1863, Cornyn and Bowen went too far. Cornyn and Bowen were both under arrest on August 10, 1863 in Corinth, Mississippi. This time, Cornyn had been brought up on court-martial charges by Bowen. During a break in the proceedings, Cornyn punched Bowen in the face. Order in the courtroom! Bowen responded by... <laughs> yes, shooting Cornyn three times. Cornyn bled to death on the courtroom floor. Meanwhile, in May of 1863, Kate's little brother, Leslie Norman, had been commissioned as a first lieutenant in Benteen's 10th Missouri Cavalry. <laughs> July of 1863 was a really big month around the time that Grant took Vicksburg and the Army of the Potomac f defeated Lee at Gettysburg. And while Benteen was leading an incredibly bloody charge in Alabama, Kate Benteen, back in St. Louis, gave birth to a daughter. She named the baby Caroline after Benteen's mother. Benteen would not get to meet his daughter until she was about three months old. But Benteen sure stayed busy. He had been often put in leadership positions after Colonel, sorry, Lieutenant Colonel Bowen killed Colonel Cornyn, command of the 10th Missouri went to a young Colonel Winslow. More than once, Benteen served as the acting commander of Winslow's brigade, and he continuously impressed his superiors. He is often singled out for, quote, valuable and gallant service, or, quote, coolness and skill, and, quote, fearless and distinguished success in the field of battle. Now, one commander who had a profound effect on Benteen was the 27-year-old West Point graduate Boy General, Major General James Harrison Wilson, who became the commander of the Cavalry Corps, Military Division of the Mississippi, in September 1864. On March 10, 1865, Benteen's daughter Caroline, about 20 months old, died in St. Louis. Benteen was not there with Kate. He was part of General Wilson's raid down south. On March 31st, Wilson's raid brought the 10th Missouri and Benteen to Selma, Alabama. 
Selma was the last bastion and one of the largest arsenals of the Confederacy. Wilson's forces had no choice but to try a near suicidal frontal assault. Benteen warned a fellow officer that all they could depend on for help were, quote, stout hearts and Spencer carbines. Wilson, sh Wilson shouted, go in boys, give him hell. Then teens men started running. They pushed on through the smoke and bullets and artillery, scaled the works and waved their hats in triumph. The rebel defenses totally folded after their attack and the 10th Missouri did not lose one man. The Union had a key edge on that day, firepower. They had repeating Spencer carbines, but it was the audacity of the cavalry officers, Wilson, Upton, Winslow, Benteen, who used that edge and momentum to win. A few days later, another unfortunate family drama plays out. Kate's brother, Lieutenant Leslie Norman, goes out for a night in the captured city, gets drunk, and he threatens to shoot General Winslow. He is immediately court-martialed. Benteen himself is on the court. Three weeks later, they allow Leslie Norman to resign his commission. General Lee surrenders on April 9, 1865. I can't help but think that this must have been an almost disappointing finish for the Benteen family. Benteen and Kate had to be in mourning over the loss of their firstborn. Benteen's brother-in-law just lost his commission if he had held out just a little bit longer. And Benteen's most glorious fight at Selma is completely overshadowed by the surrender of the South and the end of the war. In June 1865, Wilson's Cavalry Corps was disbanded, including the 10th Missouri, which was divided up. Benteen was given command of the 138th United States Colored Troops in Atlanta, a newly created volunteer unit whose ranks were filled with the African Americans who followed Wilson's Cavalry Corps on its march through Alabama and Georgia. Benteen filled the officer positions with his friends from the 10th Missouri. While he was in Atlanta, Benteen bought 115 acres of property he wanted to develop into a farm. In January 1866, most of the volunteer regiments were disbanded, including the 138th USCT, and Benteen, like so many Civil War volunteers, was a civilian again. By spring, Kate joined him from St. Louis, Benteen had built a stable, but he was still living in a tent. On the night of May 6th, 1866, while they were reading and writing letters in their tent, Benteen and her, Kate heard a gunshot. Benteen grabbed his money, his watch, and his pistol, and he ran outside. He threw the money and watch in a bush, but he kept that pistol, and he shouted, Who comes there? When men approached him in the dark, and didn't reply, he started shooting. His assailants shot too. They wounded Benteen in the hip and calf. They stole Benteen's four horses <laughs> and his fine military saddle. Benteen had not been injured in the entire war, but he was shot on his own property in peacetime. He was too wounded to man his farm. However, lucky for Benteen, he knew someone who'd recently been released from prison, who didn't know who had put him there, and who was looking for a job. <laughs> Charlie Benteen becomes the overseer on Benteen's land. Meanwhile, Benteen eh, decided maybe a farmer's life wasn't for him and Kate after all. He applied for a job in the regular army and got letters of recommendation from all those commanders who had been so impressed with him. In November of 1866, he accepted a captain's commission with the newly formed 7th Cavalry. He had, 
healed up enough that he passed the military physical, and in January 1867, Benteen left a pregnant Kate in Atlanta and headed out to join his new regiment at Fort Riley, Kansas. So Captain Frederick Benteen reported to the quarters of his new commander, Lieutenant Colonel George Armstrong Custer at Fort Riley, Kansas on January 30th, 1867. Now we know that Benteen and Custer discussed Wilson. We only have Benteen's version of events written to the photographer D.F. Barry in 1895. That's almost 30 years later. Benteen claimed that Custer, quote, produced his order book, which contain, contained his valedictory order to his old division. And I tell you, Barry, the order abounded in bluster, brag, and gush. Well, the farewell address of Major General J.W. Wilson was such a beautiful composition, so brief and concise. And having a copy of it with me, I promised to let General Custer see it which he was anxious to do, Mrs. Custer chipping in. That General Wilson wrote beautifully. They must, after reading same, have seen what was in my mind's eye. So since we know this was the conversation touched upon, let's quickly go over Wilson and Custer's careers and see what might have been the issue there. Wilson and Custer were both graduates of West Point. Wilson in the class of 1860, Custer in the second class of 1861. Both were cavalry officers. <laughs> Although Wilson had originally been an engineering officer, his switch to the cavalry was not universally accepted. Custer had written to Libby in 1864 that Wilson had, quote, made himself ridiculous by the ignorance he displays in regard to the cavalry. Custer and Wilson were both, quote, boy generals who had been promoted to brigadier general of volunteers. Wilson was a favorite of General Grant. Custer was a favorite of General Sheridan. Wilson had been the commander of the 3rd Cavalry Division in the Army of the Potomac when Custer was commanding the Michigan Brigade. And Wilson got into a few scrapes he could not easily get out of. After one such fight, Custer wrote, again to Libby, quote, Wilson proved himself an imbecile and nearly ruined the Corps by his blunders. General Sheridan sent me to rescue him, though I was in a different part of the field. You might think that's just Custer bragging, but there is some evidence to back up Custer's claims. Sheridan also said, quote, Custer is the ablest man in the Cavalry Corps. And one of Sheridan's aides had said, quote, Custer saved the Cavalry Corps. Supposedly, the 1st Vermont Cavalry was so disgusted with Wilson's performance that they sent a request for a pair of Custer's old boots to lead the 3rd Cavalry Division instead of Wilson. <laughs> when Wilson was transferred to the Military Division of the Mississippi, where he would soon be in charge of Benteen's 10th Missouri, Custer was chosen to fill Wilson's place as the commander of the 3rd Cavalry Corps. So, now we know that Custer had a few choice things to say about Wilson in the past, and that the very speech Custer chose to read to Benteen was the one in which Custer took over Wilson's command. We also know that Benteen was probably already sore about um, that the fact that the Wilson's raid in the South, including the raid in Selma, had been mostly overlooked while Custer's career had been constantly in the limelight. We also know that Benteen so admired Wilson, who had been his commander for five months, that's it, he would give his firstborn son the middle name of Wilson. So Benteen was a big fan of Wilson. Whatever the exchange was, Benteen was still very bitter nearly 30 years later. Custer did not make a good impression on Benteen. 
Benteen would never forget it. We're going to see a lot more of this the next time around. Thank you for watching. You made it all the way through. Fred and Frabi appreciate it so much. Um, so, as I said, I'll have part two coming out soon, and that's where we'll really get into the Seventh Cavalry and Fred Benteen's life there. Um, if you are really interested in Fred Benteen, I highly recommend you try and find a way to get to the Hargret Rare Book and Manuscript Library in Athens, Georgia. It's incredible to see all of his letters, his photos, his scrapbooks, as I mentioned earlier, um, his map that he, a hand-drawn map that he did of the Little Bighorn fight a few days after the battle. Um, the staff there is wonderful. They've been really good to me. I was first there in the summer of 2018 doing research and they have not gotten rid of me since. Um, Mary Linneman especially. I continue to email that poor woman to ask her to scan photos and clarify information and letters and dates, and she's just been beautiful. Um, a huge thank you to my friend Annie Donofrio, who's just been uh, continuously doing research on the Norman family, so Kate and her siblings and her parents, and just she's been digging up all sorts of things that you wouldn't usually be able to find unless you're really smart like Annie. Um, because Fred, there are quite a few books on Fred. I think there's at least three biographies on him, at least I have three. Um, but if you want to read more about him, there's a book list. Uh, I have it broken down into levels of interest. So if you're just a little interest, a little interested in this sort of thing, there's just a couple books. And then if you're like, ah, hmm, let me keep reading. There's another book. And then if you're kind of crazy like I am, there are some harder to find books, but they're just incredible. Um, thanks also to my friend Dale Cosman, who has all those books and a lot more and has been really uh, generous with giving me any info that I've needed, and he knows everything, so it's been very helpful. And to all my friends, the Little Bighorn Associates, if you're interested yourself, join it. It's a great, a great group of people, um, great events, a great way to learn more about our history. So thank you, subscribe, please subscribe, and I promise I'm working hard on the next one, and I am so grateful that you watched. All right. Thanks so much. Bye-bye.